Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 761. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 27th, 2022. All right, welcome to another program. I'm glad you could break yourself away from the Weather Channel in order to, to fit us in. I know there's a lot happening around the world, uh, but especially in Florida, my home state and Georgia's home state. So uh, welcome to the program. If you really like this program, please click the like button on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, if you don't like the program, please click the like button on YouTube or Facebook. It's free advertising for us. And if you get through this program, you say, I, I, I think Kevin and George are wrong, or I have something I could add, or I have a story that they want to write about, you go to the comment section on YouTube and you put that information there. Because the, the show never stops until you stop commenting. George, how are you doing this Armageddon Day in Florida? Well, Kevin, you're joking, but uh, it mm. does seem outside, if you watch the TV, that the world is going to end tomorrow. This Hurricane Ian is coming up the west coast of Florida. It'll mm -hmm. come ashore somewhere between Sarasota and Cedar Key. Cedar Key is about 35 miles up the coast from us. And we're expecting major storm, category two or three. Four. And four. four. And the uh, highways are packed. Uh, the uh, supermarkets, the shelves are bare, the, their lines at the gas station. Some people are leaving, others are battening down the hatches. Uh, we have teams from the parish going around to some of our shut-ins and securing their homes, moving porch furniture and just getting ready. It's uh, it's actually quite exciting. It's uh, like waiting for a, a bomb to go off or a storm to, well, a storm to hit. <laughs> That's what we're waiting for. Well, I live in the Florida Grand Motor Coach Resort uh, in Florida, in Webster. It's about 45 minutes south east of where George lives. And right now, Florida Grand Motor Coach Resort is empty. All my neighbors decided when they announced it was going to be a, a Category 3, Category 4 hurricane that they would pack up their motorhomes and head north. Well, guess where they're stuck right now, George? You know, <laughs> On I-95 and <laughs> yeah. I-70. <laughs> oh. So, yeah. But, you know, that that's kind of what this lifestyle allows. I'm still here in North Carolina. We just finished up the new Wineskins Conference uh, in Asheville, the Black Mountain area. Great conference and had a lot of fun. Uh, but now it's time to do some news. And there's not a lot of news. So George and I are going to wing it here. This is kind of what we can do. We can stretch it out a little bit. But let's see if we can do 55 minutes, which is two news stories, George. <laughs> so we've done first, it before. We've done it before. Not a big deal. First news story: National Cathedral announces fundraising, and they started with an initial 115 million dollars. How is that possible, George? There are a lot of woke people. With National money. Cathedral was damaged a few years ago by a, uh, uh, an earthquake. And they also need money to fund their uh, uh, outreach and ministries. Um, I don't know what they are, but they need money. And so tours. They started, They're tours, they started, George. <laughs> yes, it's a wonderful tourist attraction. And every time a president or a prominent figure dies, Supreme mm -hmm. Court justice or whatnot, they have beautiful funerals there. Well, they've started a fundraising campaign, and they announced yesterday that the initial sort of non-public phase they've raised 115 million dollars so they're confident that in the next two years they'll raise the remaining uh, 35 million to hit the 150 million dollar target friends not all the money in the episcopal church has gone to lawyers somebody's got a lot of very deep pockets well okay the enemy has always had a lot of money in this I remember from the youngest age in, in college and, and later years, this is the 80s, seeing all the donations that were made to um, different activists back then. I go, wow, where does that person get all that money that they can donate uh, $250,000 to do this socialist cause uh, in Ronald Reagan's America? And uh, so uh, that has not changed. Uh, money froze, uh, flows freely uh in bad places george yeah and 
actually, Kevin, it's been true for so long that I don't. We don't really worry about it. I don't worry about it. The conservative movements don't worry about it because we don't. We don't expect conservative or traditionally minded groups or causes to be to be well funded. We, in other words, we just do the work and pray that God provides. Whereas the liberal groups have, you know, you know, the National Episcopal Church gives out hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of grants each year for projects. And if you look at the projects, they're like, oh, raising awareness for transgender teens in rural Nebraska. But basically, you know, that fifty thousand dollars just to pay some activist to twiddle their thumbs for a year. And send now, in what a report. Could, yeah, they, they want the yeah. report because that's what the money bought the report. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, $50,000 could buy, if I had it, would buy a youth minister mm-hmm. or could pay, you know, move a part time priest to a full time priest. But that's not how the church operates. And it's not just the Episcopal Church, the Church of England is like that. I, I've contacted uh, Lambeth Palace uh, for a comment about it, st- that a story I'm working on. And of course, they've had they've been busy the uh, past few weeks. But about a month ago, Lambeth Palace announced that they were advertising the position of an assistant to Mrs. Carolyn Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury's wife. She would have a full-time paid assistant, and I think the salary was twenty-eight thousand pounds. Wow! And I and I wrote to them saying, "Where uh, is this money coming from?" And in other words who's paying for this and because i i contacted mrs Car- lady carey former archbishop of canterbury's wife and she said they never gave me an assistant true during the lambeth conferences they give me somebody to help with the spouses conference but you know the church of england has money to throw at uh, giving mrs welby who has no position within the church of england other than being married to the archbishop giving her a full-time assistant whereas they're meanwhile they're closing parishes and oh i'm sorry you've running four parishes right now you're going to have to up it to seven because we have no money there seems always to be money for the national cathedral for their tour guides and docent programs or for aids to the archbishop's wife and but there's never enough money in from these institutions to do actual the real work of ministry um well, that's true. I mean, all their money goes to, seems to be a waste of money. Uh, within uh, orthodoxy, within the Anglican Church, you don't need money to do amazing things. You need believers to do it, and mm-hmm. people who are faithful in prayer. And we see this all over the world where uh, very little money, but very faithful believers uh, raise up churches and raise up communities, uh, feed the starving. Uh, I was just uh, talking to people who are, who are helping feed people uh, through the Ugandan starvation. And I'm like, mm-hmm. wow. And did they have a lot of money? No. There are a lot of faithful believers who found people with trucks, who found people with food, who uh, were able to organize food kitchens uh, to package this food, and they delivered hundreds of thousands of meals in uh, a province of Uganda where starvation is very uh, ripe right now uh, because mm-hmm. of, I mean, it's not flooding, but they certainly have a drought going on over there. So yeah, the yeah. terrible, dr- terrible drought in the uh, e- uh, East Africa, uh, Great Lakes region, and yet the church is stepping up to do its job. Uh, you once re- you once interviewed one of these lost boys who became a bishop or mm-hmm. uh, from South uh, Sudan. Yeah, I, I the the new one is Abraham. I uh, think I interviewed uh, Isaac uh, back at uh, uh, St. John's Newport Beach about ten years ago. And just great witnesses to people who uh, were forced by by war in South Sudan to take to the road uh, and walk hundreds uh, of miles to safety. Uh, many of them ended up in Rwanda and other countries uh, because of the genocide that was happening in Sudan at the time. And these boys, when they arrived at different places in Africa, were witnessed to by the church and because of the persecution they were just under they instantly uh discovered their faith Mm -hmm. and have become you know wonderful clergy and uh, bishops within the anglican community and but money 
is wonderful thing when you have it, but it also money can basically corrupt ministry. Not sure. Uh, it right now in China, the situation for Christians has not been this bad since the Cultural Revolution in the '60s. Uh, minister ministers in the uh, house churches are actively being arrested, and the official state sanctioned churches, the three self three self patriotic movement churches. They're being closely monitored, and we've had stories where the Ten Commandments are taken down from the wall of the church, and the sayings of Chairman Mao or, or uh, uh, Chairman Xi are put up. Uh, in Hong Kong, the Anglican Diocese, the archbishops there, have been completely silent, or actually pro-Peking. And I hate to say this, but for me, it's it, it's dominated by the fact that they have all these property and all this money that they could lose if they don't play their cards right. Whereas in the mainland, when all the churches were taken away by the communists, these uh, house church leaders, they have nothing to lose in terms of financial purposes, yet they're the ones actually converting and bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to people uh, who've not heard it before. So. Sometimes money is a hindrance to evangelism because you do everything you can to protect it rather than use it to spread the gospel. And we see that in China today. Well, China is a great example how money compromises you, whether it's in religion or in business. Apple has had to make several sacrifices to their business model to get into China. So has Tesla and many other firms, Facebook. China has a rule that if you operate a business uh, not a headquarters, but any uh, um, location within their country, you have to share your user base information with them. So Kevin Carlson's user information, because I have a Facebook account, is known to the Chinese government. Uh, my Apple accounts are known to the Chinese government. My contact information has been shared with the Chinese government because that's the compromise they make to have access to their uh, large billion uh, people, you know, five billion, six billion, eight billion, they got lots of billions over there, uh, people uh, that Apple would love to, to make money in and are going to compromise their morals in order to make money over there. Money is always compromising within the church. We've seen it over and over again. Uh, we watched, you know, how many times has uh, Trinity Wall Street bought out a conference uh, and sent the people that they wanted to send? You know, it, it is what it is. Uh, um, they've now bought out a seminary, the uh, Church Divinity School of the Pacific. Yeah. Well, it was already liberal, <laughs> but they've put enough money into it to make sure it stays that way. Yeah, Whereas so well. I don't think Trinity Wall Street is giving a dime to Trinity Seminary or Neshota House. No. And oddly enough, those two are, they could always use more money, but they're doing okay. I talked to the uh, new president uh, or dean of Trinity this weekend, and they're still funding uh, the students' education fully. You can go there without paying any tuition uh, because of all their donors and financing that they've set up over the years. Um, and this is uncorrupted money. And they don't, they don't brag about it, but if you need a tuition assistance or full tuition paid come on over we'll take care of you hopefully they, they, that allows them to better vet their students but uh you know it, as we've talked about god does not need our money god needs our faithfulness our prayers our belief um uh, the money is so much so secondary in in the christian kingdom let's hey, we just yeah. had either a sunday or a daily office service where Paul writes, the love of money is the root of all evil. I can't it remember is. if it was this past Sunday or the past day in, in the morning evening prayer. But uh, Yeah, I think it was an evening prayer a couple weeks ago. It yeah. really is true in that uh, love of money, uh, love of comfort, love of respectability, love of position mm -hmm. are things that destroy the ministry, I think. And, uh, you know, Paul tells us to be fools for Christ. And in America... Uh, it's foolish to set off to the other side of the world to bring the good news of Jesus Christ when you're living hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. Our friend Father Argo in the Middle East, that's foolish. You can get killed. You're not going to get rich and famous and powerful. We can't even use his real name. So nobody knows this, what this incredible <clears throat> fellow is doing. Because yeah. well, the culture yeah. says that's wrong. Yeah. I mean, at New Wineskins, you get to, to meet the missionaries of the world. 
And uh, every three years, they fly back here to America and have a missionary conference where they encourage one another, they share the stories, they attend teachings and, and talks, and then they go back out. And I got to meet 900 different missionaries from around the world uh, this week, shook hands. A lot of them are, are fans and viewers of the program. I want to thank them for taking time and their busy ministries to, to even uh, watch on Skype. They said, you're the only place we get our news. I'm like... That's so humbling. <laughs> I'm so I'm a wretched person. <laughs> but, Kevin, you, know. you did tell me you did tell me there's a downside, and that uh, your wife Jill was one of the greeters at the conference, and she oh, shook. <laughs> she greeted all 1,500 attendees, and uh, a day later, she was. <clears throat> Oh, I think I have a sore throat. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Somebody came and gave her a cold. And uh, so well, she's, she's on the other room. I hope Ebola, because that's on the loose Ebola. again in West Africa. <laughs> yeah, but she's in the other room. I, I've got both doors closed so that we don't hear her going. <laughs> so, yeah, so I hope you feel better. We're going to pray for you. But, you know, I hope uh, maybe co I hope COVID didn't break out. I don't think it did, because um, I think this is just one of those colds. And that's the cool thing, right? Now, now that COVID has ebbed, and we've come back to a, a place where normal colds, flu have returned to be more predominant than uh, COVID and, uh, and allergies and everything else. So the world is slowly returning to normal, except if you watch the Weather Channel. George, the news I read, the only interesting news I saw in the, in the church world uh, that relates to Anklin scripted is Desmond Tutu's daughter was denied a license to preach um, and officiate by the Church of England at her father's funeral. Is that Not, right? Uh, her, her godfather's funeral. Godfather's funeral, sorry. However, through whatever means, she was able to do it anyway. So let's talk about the story. Mfo Tutu Van, Fir Van Firth is uh, one of Desmond Tutu's children. She is uh, in a same-sex marriage with a Dutch woman. She was ordained in the Episcopal Church about uh, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, but she's not been an active priest for many, many years. She uh, uh, was refused a license in South Africa uh, because that its South African church does not permit same partnered, same gendered clergy who are in marriages to exercise pastoral ministry. Um, Tutu's godfather died and before his death, he asked her to preside at his funeral, which was going to be in England. Well, the, to, to do that, for any minister to preside at a Church of England parish for a service, you have to have a lot, you have to get permission. And this is not an active priest. So this is not somebody where Bishop A can call Bishop B and say, this is one of my people and whatnot. Rather, uh, she's basically, <clears throat> A retired or inactive clergy person who does not belong to the Church of England and she wanted to be able to celebrate and act as a priest in the Church of England well uh, the, the bishop the diocese there said no because these are the rules first you know and one of them was that she is in a same-sex marriage well this this provided outrage to those who are waiting to be outraged so Jan O'Zain, the, uh, the uh, lesbian activist in the Church of England, talked about the moral cruelty of this and that and the other. And the joke of it is, it's not a joke, but that the Bishop of Hereford put out a letter, and he's considered an evangelical, saying we've done bent over backwards to accommodate her and you know, allowing her to preach and do this and that. She just can't do the Eucharist at the funeral. And, oh gosh, I wish the bishop said that this weren't so, but uh, uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to do this. So, it, the Church of England is going down the toilet pretty darn quickly. It has its rules. Yes. Yeah. It has its rules, but a bishop who's considered an evangelical is rubbishing his own church's rules and regulations on this very point. So what's going to happen when they finish this living and love and faith uh, dialogue and uh, where with well, the writings on the wall uh, <laughs> it is a, mini, mini but <clears throat> it, it's a non-story because you know uh, 
if I went to a Catholic church and demanded the right to celebrate at their altar for my my brother-in-law's wife is a Roman Catholic, let's say I wanted to do her funeral, of course they'd say no. I mean, I'm not an, a, not a validly ordained priest. I mean, they might allow me to give up a little homily or something, which is what the Church of England did, mm -hmm. but it's being turned into a, another outrage. It's a manufactured outrage. It's a fake story. And it, once again, the... Uh, soft evangelicals the squishy let's can't let's you know the squishy emotionally driven evangelicals of the church of england are getting rolled and taken to and taken advantage of well they are to back up two three no five years ago the church of england canceled the license of the archbishop of canterbury george carey because he was a professor in the school that produced a pervert I, I, that was an outrage. This is not an outrage. This is the church following its rules. Not creating a rule or a set of circumstances they never really investigated. Okay, so let's keep our outrages uh, simple and sane, George. But the power of the gay move lobby in the oh, Church yeah. of England is that they're perpetually outraged. They're perpetually aggrieved. It's never enough. The Lambeth Conference, where Justin Welby basically gave them a place within the church by saying they have a recognized, valid theological position, that wasn't enough for the gay lobby. Yeah. That wasn't enough. Jan Ozan, the same uh, professional complainer and scold, uh, <clears throat> said, you know, this how cruel this is that you don't say that we are the church, not, not, not the inheritors of the faith once received from the apostles in Christ. <sighs> deep sigh deep sigh and this is just the craziness you know that we, we see within the church of england and you know, perpetuated uh in the anglican community as a whole it, quite often it, it, it all it also speaks to my mind of the lack of spiritual maturity of so many of these people jan ozain uh, mfo tutu uh, because they have this concept that they have a right to exercise office and a right to conduct ministry when in reality <clears throat> all that authority is derived de derived from your faith in Jesus Christ not from a piece of paper you get from the archbishop or from the bishop and these people <clears throat> their lack of understanding of who Jesus is and how he works in this world and what is important and what is unimportant is so breathtaking in their ignorance. And I hate to say it, but so many people in the pews are like that. They just don't understand what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. And they well, get so worked up about not inessentials. We have two things going on here with the um, activist LGTB community or the woke community. Uh, let me open it up bigger where they they now don't have just money power they have the power to cancel if mm -hmm. you disagree with them they are so fascist that they will go the further step to make sure that you don't have a job that you don't have money that you don't have any influence in culture it's amazing the anglican unscripted survives in this type of culture but their job is to make sure that if you don't agree with them you don't get to speak and that's that's one aspect um the second aspect i completely forgot about it we'll, we'll stick with the first aspect george um what oh the, the second one is they have all this money mm -hmm. you know and so that money buys the influence and, and can com compromises people's position one slowly bit at a time they, and and J justin is a great example he became slowly compromised by the lgtp community it wasn't something that happened overnight they just kept whispering in his ear you know well did god really say that and let's see they may have money they may have political power but we have jesus christ oh absolutely yeah we know we our salvation cannot be taken away from us by some crank in the uh, suburbs of london who's upset about uh, info tutu our salvation is in christ is assured and the problem is that the world has been against us from the very beginning and what i the sad story of justin welby is somebody who seeks to accommodate the world to make christianity palatable to satan 
and the satanic forces that rule. Who is the prince of this world? It's Satan. And mm -hmm. Justin Welby seeks to make Satan uh, happy with the latest and greatest policies of the Church of England. And it's never going to work. And so why even bother, you know, seeking to accommodate and, you know, when you start dealing away portions of your faith to go along and get along, pretty soon your faith is gone. You got to stand for something at some point in your life. Uh, well, one of, the, one of the greatest characteristics of being a Christian is to be humble, to stand fast, um, and, and to uh, finish the race well. There are many bishops in the Anglican Communion and uh, priests who are not finishing well, who are not mm -hmm. sticking out the fight, who are willing to compromise in order to grow their church. If you're compromising your faith to, to grow your church and you're compromising the lives of the people you shepherd, I, the Bible does not speak well of your future. Um, this, is, this is the same story we had last, last show with uh, the new rector of Holy Trinity, Brompton. Mm -hmm. where he's going to avoid the whole gay issue because he's got a brand to protect. And gays have bought into the Alpha movement, and therefore he's going to change the original teaching so as not to offend customers. He's not a Christian priest anymore. He's a corporate Compr manager of a brand. Yep, you've been compromised. Uh, well, George, we're really doing well. We got 26 minutes and two stories. We're going to rock this. I, we're going to go 60 minutes at least. Okay, I'm here. Black Mountain, North Carolina, right outside of Asheville. I've been attending the new Wineskins Conference 2022. Had 1,500, uh, 1,600 people fly in here to attend the conference. Some people stayed. In fact, all the ACNA bishops stayed to have a conclave. Kevin, a conclave? Isn't it called a secret conclave? No, that would be an oxymoron. A conclave is already secret. And they're meeting here to discuss some issues. And when I heard there was a conclave, I tried my best to squeeze out of some bishops what they're going to talk about. And I could not even get Andrew Gross, the communications person, uh, head of the ACNA, to admit that there was a conclave. He said, I can neither confirm nor deny that there is a conclave happening at Black Mountain this week. Oh, that's weird. Okay, fine. So when approaching and talking to some bishops off the record, they said, we can neither confirm nor deny that there is a conclave happening this week at uh, Ridgecrest. However, one bishop said, but we have a lot of snotty-nosed woke unvetted priest in the ACNA that we may want to talk about. What? Distance and email has sort of broken down some barriers because mm -hmm. I was able to confirm that they are having a conclave. The talk is ecclesiology and that focus is going to be C4SO. So when we put all these pieces together, plus we have an official denial no, no, not a denial. We have, we cannot confirm or deny that Which they're awesome. meeting. And, yeah. and of course, they like to meet whenever they can and when it's opportune because, you know, they have these two formal meetings and perhaps this is an informal gathering. Yak, yak, yak. So, uh, and I said, this is what I'm told they're talking about. And nobody said, no, it's not. So we can sort of assume, and of course, we could be very wrong. And it's not the first time. No. Uh, well, it'd be the first time that we're very wrong. But we could be wrong. And uh, if we are wrong and you are a bishop in the ACNA, please go to the comment section and correct us. That's, that's, um, that. Now, there's been a struggle with um, wokeness within the ACNA. And it started uh, probably when they're five or six years into their, their, their growth. And the REC kind of complained about it. Other uh, Orthodox factions within the ACNA said, listen, you got some uh, priest out in the West, who are saying stuff on Twitter that doesn't make any sense, that is kind of anti-gospel, that doesn't talk about the renewal and the, the uh, uh, of the gospel. And I said, yeah, there's a lot going on. Uh, Ray Sutton wrote a, a nice little uh, uh, letter about this. And so I'm wondering if they're finally going to address that, George. Well, I assume they are because you cannot have 
uh, a diocese that uh, affirms critical race theory, for example, within yep. the structures of the ACNA, because what they're affirming is that uh, Christ did not die for all, that uh, it, it's just, uh, Ray Sutton really did do a good job, and I referred to his piece, which is on Anglican Inc., just look up Ray I'll, Sutton. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes so people can follow. And it, But there is this problem, and they're all aware, the bishops are all aware of it, and how they're being made aware of it is that people who start to become active in the ACNA and they start reading, they start participating, the C4SO has a stronger media presence than most others, and they read this stuff coming out of there under the ACNA banner, under the or video or things on Twitter that ACNA leaders uh, from this diocese or clergy, excuse me, not just leaders, clergy are talking about. And they bring it to their clergy, and the clergy said, well, we don't believe that. And the clergy complained to their bishops, and the bishops are now taking it together um, well, to, to, I, to, to discuss together. Well, this is 10 priest mm -hmm. tops and a couple of deacons. Absolutely. And, no, and, nobody's but, correcting them is the problem, George. And, and bad, you know, from, you remember at Gresham's Law of Economics, I think it's bad money drives out good money. Right. So, you know... I remember when we had the horrors of the Catholic priest uh, abuse s scandal 20 odd years ago. Uh, for the first time in my ministry, if I'd walk around with a collar on, let's say at the airport in Philadelphia, people would look at me askance like I was a pervert mm -hmm. because one guy in another denomination had done something. All people wearing collars were therefore suspect. And that's gone away, thank, thank goodness. Uh, but it, when you've got one priest who's active on Twitter writing these woke things that could come out of the mouth of uh, uh, oh, the, <laughs> the, the 1619 <laughs> Project people. Yeah, It really does harm to the greater institution. Um, but hey, that's my view. Well, hopefully we have more influence than they do. Um, I say in humility. But uh, um, we have to watch out for this. We'll have to see what happens in the con Well, we won't be able to see what happens in the conclave. Hopefully, we can uh, gather together some press releases over the next couple of weeks and connect the dots to what happened, or we'll see some reforms within uh, the ACNA, or a diocese will uh, be forced to hold their uh, uh, ministers accountable for what they say on Twitter. Um, hopefully. I think, I think what I, my sources, and I'm sure. They're probably the same as your sources, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, not all, but uh, this is not being done out of political animosity or jealousy. This is being done out of spirit of love and fraternal correction. The people I've spoken with are not like, oh, these SOBs, blah, 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 but rather, gosh, if these only, if these guys just didn't, if they focused on Christ and the real message and the real work, they wouldn't be leading people astray. And we have a duty to help them get out of this hole. So, see, here's the difference between my experiences of the Episcopal Church is that so much of the political fights were personal animosity. Bill Love was persecuted because he was not one of the boys. He didn't go along to get along. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the attack on Bill Love, the attack on uh, Mark Lawrence, the attack on John David Schofield, Keith Ackerman, were driven were yeah. driven as much by personal unpopularity with the mob than they were with the issues. And this is totally unlike that. This is more in a spirit of fraternal correction, trying to get trying to get the ship rightened and uh, on a level plane, level keel. ACNA is a little older than a decade, and if they want to, to achieve uh, centuries of growth and centuries of being a, a healthy church, they need to have accountability within their church, and they need to be able to round up rogue priests and, and bishops. And for the most part, uh, the bishops in the ACNA don't complain about each other in public. Uh, they complain about uh, topics in public, and I think that's very helpful. I remember the, the latter days of, of tech, and I, I say that because I think tech is over, but you don't, that's fine. Uh, I think that in the latter days of tech, you had bishops attacking other bishops. 
uh, publicly in, in very personal uh, savage ways and I think that was very hurtful to uh, the cause for the Episcopal Church yes mm. but it you know, I can only speak for myself on this point. I, I, I a person wrote to me, I get the letters all the time, how can you stay in the Episcopal Church? Sure. And it's because where God called me to be. <laughs> and uh, it's where God planted me to fight this good fight. Uh, I, 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 ha I had an archbishop from a foreign African co country ask me the same thing about you this week. And I said, I don't think I would employ George to be a co-host if he were acting. It'd be a boring show if all we did were uh, complain about other entities outside of the Essene. We need somebody who can uh, bounce uh, as you do within the, the Episcopal Church and your, your great critiques and our critiques of the Essene as well. Um, we have a mission here to be very transparent and not all ACNA or GAFCON or Anglican Communion news is good. Sometimes you have to report the, the dirty laundry as I like to call it and uh, that's just the nature of what we do and I do sometimes frustrate people uh, within the ACNA uh, by allowing some things to, to be made public that they would prefer not to be public. I get that. But just in yeah, the the mission is to purify the church here, not to you know keep the dirty laundry in the closet. Justin Badirama, the primate of South Sudan, leader of the Global South uh, uh, group group of churches, was asked essentially the same question I'm asked. Well, how do you stay in the Anglican Communion, uh, given what's all the craziness in England and the U.S. and Canada? And he said, well, if a snake comes into your house, do you abandon your house or do you seek to drive out the snake? Mm -hmm. And that's basically my attitude right now. Um, in my church, my house, we're winning souls for Jesus Christ. It's a, you know, the spirit is alive and powerful and all the crap that goes on elsewhere is elsewhere. And my job is to drive out the snakes in that may be trying to get into my house and into my friends and fellow Episcopalians houses. If I were to run away and build a new house, the snakes would soon follow. Um, and this is what we're talking about with C4SO. The snakes that have infested the Episcopal Church are trying to sneak into the ACNA. And it starts with these little things of, well, why can't we have critical race theory? And why can't we uh, have uh, gender neutral pronouns and why can't we reg reg call the holy spirit she you know you think well yeah in and of itself that's not you know oh God, you know okay yeah let the kooks do what they want but because nobody did this for the episcopal church 30 years ago looks what happened it's, hopefully this won't happen to the acna but i still think the episcopal church is worth fighting for yeah. Christ is worth fighting for. The church itself is worth fighting for. Names, who knows. Uh, but great example here. And I was talking to a person from the Diocese of Connecticut, a former uh, priest in the Diocese of Connecticut. In 2001, 2002, before the consecration of Gene Robinson, uh, the diocese had 181, 82 churches. That number's probably a little off, uh, depending on the, the month. A lot of churches. This is 2022, and they have less than 70, if I can count great. And most of those have populations that are dwindling out. Uh, the Diocese of Connecticut has been absolutely decimated by the desire to compromise, the desire to make sure that they uh, are one with culture, that they uh, accept all people, uh, and, and don't try to transform anybody's life. Yeah, you know, there are consequences to stand for the gospel, and you know, I uh, we we're going to elect a new bishop in Central Florida, and I was nominated. I didn't uh, go anywhere, and I was confidently told it's because uh, you would not be confirmed by the Episcopal Church. We're not going to go through a Mark Lawrence situation. You know, we need to have somebody who can get past the liberals, and you know, so hey, uh, I'm not no. I don't particularly mind because I feel God's call on my life very clearly here. But you know, you like 
everybody likes to be promoted. Everybody likes to at least be considered, you know, to, to be vetted and considered. Absolutely. And so, you know, that was on one level emotionally disappointing, but it's quite clear that God's plan is not for me to be a bishop where I would have to accommodate and go along and get along, but I'm being protected uh, to, to speak the gospel purely as, I see, as I've received it and as I understand it, and not to offer compromises. And I, some, I have a great deal of empathy and sympathy for some of these people who I know who are now members of the House of Bishops because they really are a mediocre lot. And I don't mean that unkindly in the sense that they're mediocre people, but to get where they are, they have had to give up who they are as individuals to conform to a corporate mold or mindset. Um, the old Episcopal Church, where you would have character bishops of, you know, people of different, and that's how this Jack Spongs and all that got in. You know, we, well, we could all forward one character. That's all gone. And now we have these cookie cutter, safe pair of hands, mildly liberal people. And no uh, characters like George Conger should apply. <laughs> but, but again, here, here's the thing. If I viewed my, this as a career, that would be devastating for me. But if it's a vocation, and the vocation is to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, that's irrelevant in the calculations. Mm-hmm. Indeed. George, I got some strange news here. We're 40 minutes in, and we're just about to hit our fourth story. Let's talk. Yeah. I'm just like one, two, three, four. Okay. <laughs> yeah, see? Uh, let's talk about South Carolina. Has the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina has reached a uh, settlement, so to speak, with the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina. They haven't put out a lot of details yet, um, but they did say the camp is going from the hands of the Anglicans to the Episcopalians. I thought we could talk a little bit about what we know and how this is kind of the end of a long, long saga one of the longest legal legal uh, sagas within uh, the Episcopal Anglican War, uh, but certainly one that I'm like, finally, okay, you know, I, sure, I love being a reporter, I love reporting on this type of stuff, I love breaking news, I don't like the church in the courts. So what's the story here, George? Well, in the case of Jaundice versus Jaundice, which is a, a Dickens yes, uh, that's reference, right. <laughs> South Carolina versus South Carolina has... The, the two parties released a joint press statement yesterday saying they had settled all issues between the dioceses. Uh, they weren't going to go into details, but some things were the Camp Christopher would go from uh, the P- Anglican Diocese on October 1st to the Episcopal Diocese. Now, there are three parishes that are still waiting for a decision from the Supreme Court over whether they can remain Anglican in their buildings or whether they have to vacate. And there are other suits where those who've had to vacate are suing because we've done all these improvements in the last 10 years. You've got this improved property, therefore we need to be compensated for the improvements. Those are not diocesan level, and those will continue on. But the main battle between the Anglican and Episcopal Church is done with this agreement between the two newish bishops. Uh, Bishop Woodliffe Stanley, I think, was consecrated last year at the Episcopal Diocese. And um, just going out of my head, the uh, Anglican Bishop. Uh, oh, the Episcopal Bishop. Sorry. The, Bishop. Episcopal, the Anglican <sighs> Bishop. He's got a red hair and a red beard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I'm an old man, Kevin. I'm an uh, old man. Yeah, that's fine. I'm trying to find it in the article, too. I thought it was Alec something. Uh, oh, that's Pittsburgh. I, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Why don't they have it in the story here? You know, it's what Tuesday morning, and we can't think straight. Oh, well. it's, it didn't oh, even why? make the press release. Whatever. Oh, okay. well, they have settled this. They're both new, and they want to get on with doing the ministry as they see it need being done. Mm-hmm. Now, now, one Bishop could sus- Edgar, Edgar, Chip Edgar. There you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Oh my. Uh, that's why we call this unscripted. Too much anesthesia after that yeah, operation. It's, yes. Oof, now, right. now, to be a little hard nosed and slightly cynical, now that Camp Christopher has gone to the Episcopal Diocese and the Episcopal Diocese doesn't have any children, uh, here's a prime opportunity to sell some real estate and make it a right. buck. Yeah. 
So in other words, the now the Episcopal Diocese may think, well, one day, since we have it, they will come. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. In the Episcopal Those Diocese. days are over. We've got some yeah. beautiful buildings that uh, yeah. that's because they're built. People aren't coming. So there's a windfall for the Episcopal Diocese, but who knows, 815 may step in and say, well, we want to be reimbursed for all the millions we've spent on your behalf. Wasted, not spent, wasted. Wasted, waste, yes. waste. so we'll, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. But, you know, it is good uh, to allow people to get on with the work that they feel called to do. And I don't think anybody, no, I know neither Bishop, Bishop Edgar, Bishop uh, Rudolph Stanley, feel called to be lawyers litigating in the South Carolina courts for an eternity. Yeah, could you imagine this going another 10 years, uh, you know, another 10? Oh, yeah, I could, imagine. I, could, yeah. I could imagine it. I yeah. mean, it's a good thing that uh, I'm going to say there are some evil people in this world. And there are some people, and I've encountered them in the church many, many times, mm -hmm. in the institutional church, yep. who thrive on controversy and pain and whose motives are not godly, but they're empire building they are enriching themselves making themselves powerful and part of the problem is when you have these lawsuits those sorts of people on both sides come out of the woodworks yeah. and sometimes drive the process no you may be referring to a former bishop of new jersey for many many years ago but whatever okay so yeah uh, they, they exist in the church evil exists within the church and uh it's nice to see this settled. One thing, when you go before a judge, the last thing he wants to do is take anything to trial. It's a waste of his time. He'd rather have free time, meet in his chambers. If he could get two sides to settle, uh, that's his or her desire. And you'd be surprised how often they, uh, they send you to mediation, you come back, well, we don't have, we couldn't do, go back. And you come back a couple hours later, we couldn't agree on anything, I don't care, go back. And the judge wants you to mediate this out. And we talked about compromise earlier in morals and with money and stuff like that. This is a different type of compromise, George. This is uh, in order to just move on. Yes, we are fully right. We have the law on our side. The, the legal process is corrupt. The judges are stupid. However, at some point, we just need to, to cut bait and walk away. Yeah, yeah, Christ told us if, if uh, mm -hmm. somebody asks if your coat, give it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you're not, Camp Christopher is not part of God's plan for salvation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just, Kevin, you're absolutely right about the where compromise needs to be made. In these things, I think compromise is the most effective, most efficient, most uh, prudential way forward. But when it's compromising the doctrines and the faith of Je in Jesus Christ, then you can't do it. Two quick stories before we finish up. Uh, Iran, from what I can tell on TV and through journalism, is falling apart, but you can never tell because journalism lies so often. And it's a, <laughs> one thing more corrupt than the church is journalism, George, in case you didn't know that. But I'm watching the news and I'm watching some reports about uh, the eruption of the people and civilians in Iran because a lady was killed because she wasn't uh, wearing the proper clothing according to the uh, Iranian, I forget what they're called, um, police. The religious police. Yeah, the religious police. The thing. Corrupt. And the so, church police. The church police. And so she wasn't wearing, what do they call that though? The burqa? Yeah. Yeah, they had the yeah, burqa, she, hijab. She wasn't, she wasn't wearing, wearing the burqa or the hijab correctly or at all. And they took her into the police custody to question her and make sure she wears it. And she died mysteriously. And she's beaten to death. She was died mysteriously, according to Iranian forces. And uh, she walked in. She, she walked into a <laughs> door, or door. fell out of a window, or. Uh, and the Iranian people, uh, under very corrupt government, under very uh, shut down news, state medium news have erupted the, this enough is enough already uh, and i don't know if this is going to be an arab spring but maybe iran leadership would fall within six months i don't know masa amini was the young woman's name Jewish mm -hmm. or uh ethnicity and she was arrested for not wearing face covering to the satisfaction of the morality police which is a real police force 
and her death in custody has sparked outrage and protest, public protest marches. Uh, it's, and it started off in the Kurdish regions. Remember, people forget that Iran is only 60% Iranian. Mm -hmm. They're very large Arab and Kurdish and Azerbaijani and other minorities, Armenian minorities. And in the peripheries, people began to protest the hard, heavy-handed uh, rule of the uh, morality of police. Well, this has spread to the Iranian parts of the country, and it has reached the point where Christian organizations in Iran, who are, along with Baha'i, are, are very fiercely persecuted. Now, if you're an Armenian Christian, they leave you alone, but you, you can have Armenian churches where you speak and preach in Armenian, but you're not allowed to speak in Farsi. So, but if you speak, if you preach the gospel in Farsi, you will be arrested. That's why the Anglican Diocese of Iran, which was founded by Iranian converts from Islam, has been all but made extinct. But we may have reached a tipping point. You never know in these things, but mm -hmm. there's no CIA involvement, no <laughs> dark money being spread around, no grand plans from the boys in Washington. It's just, you know, an Arab spring may be happening in Iran as winter approaches and food shortages loom and the economy's crashing. We'll just see how long uh, Iran, the, the mullahs can hold on to power. Well, I think the CIA and the FBI are too busy arresting uh, pro-lifers here in America with their SWAT teams and to, to deal with Iran. But I, I want to cover that story more fully next week. Let's finish up with uh, G. Uh, Gloria or Giodora Giot Maloney from Italy, the new prime minister over there. Uh, we talk all the time about the pendulum effect, that every country, uh, especially America, has this pendulum that goes from left, that's your left, my right, yeah, that's your left, right, left, right, uh, in politics, because the people are indecisive and they don't know what they like one year from the next year. And sometimes they just look at their TV screens and they, they do this and said, well, I'm going to vote anyway. And that happened in Italy. Italy was sick and tired with the European politics and many other internal issues and have gone. And this lady is not far right. She's she's Reagan right if you want to call her, but they they picked a uh, Repu Republican, a right uh, of center leader to be their new prime minister. George, yes, uh, Prime Minister Maloney um, is the first woman, mm -hmm. and she's the first populist prime minister in Italy. And the old parties, the old ways of doing things have just been totally wiped out. She has majorities in both houses of parliament, the legislature and uh, I'll call it Congress and Senate for American terms, but both levels. So she should be able to get stuff done if the bureaucrats don't sabotage her or the European Union. You know, the, she ran on, you know, Italy's got a crime problem and it's not the mafia. They have... The former prime minister uh, just let anybody who got off the boat f cross the Mediterranean in to stay. And so you you go to Rome, you go to the great Italian cities, and you see all these Arabs and Afghans and people from Africa milling around these single men with no work. And the crime wave that is that Italy is going through is akin to the crime wave in Chicago or New York or other places where law and order is broken down because the old woke administration a put no brakes on illegal immigration and b didn't enforce the criminal codes and the whole sort of woke uh, agenda that you know the world economic forum is uh, was pushing was the old italian government bought that hook line and sinker and the new prime minister saying is look the the, the global elites they want to destroy the family they want to destroy the church they want to destroy our sense of being Italians. And why they want to do this is to basically remove our identities, whether it's an identity in a family, our identity as Catholics or Protestants, whatever it is, or as identity as, uh, you know, members of a particular family. Sure. So that we become serfs or slaves. Revolutionaries. For <laughs> the, the marks. Yes. For the... For the great consumer spending that mm -hmm. keeps the powerful powerful. Mm -hmm. This is as much a revolt against the Bill Gates of this world 
And one of the things that always bothers me about Justin Wibley, how do I always come back to this guy, is that he is a part of the WEF circle. He goes to these meetings, he mouths their platitudes. And we, we've seen a revolt in Italy against the woke elites. Um, and one of the things is, is that Francis is on the side of the woke elites. Pope Francis and the, has basically quietly campaigned against this woman. And now we have a woman more Catholic than the Pope in sense of traditional morality in power in Italy. So we'll see what happens. I would say 20% of the Roman Catholic Church is more uh, Roman Catholic than the, the Pope. Yeah, it, it, it is what it is. So, all right, that's a, that's a full show. That is, we're three minutes short of an hour. You guys are great. We really appreciate uh, you watching the show. As we end here, we are still raising money to go to Kigali. Uh, GAFCON 4 will be meeting there next uh, spring, summer, and we want to be March. there. Good. Next March. <laughs> Next March. So if you could kindly go to anglican.inc and click on that donate button, it'll take you to our PayPal account. Somebody graciously uh, gave us a lot of money a couple weeks ago. I want to thank you for that, but uh, um, that's not going to get us there. And I appreciate the rest of you uh, sharing uh, the burden. So Well, just, you know, I priced out air tickets. It's about $1,500 from me. Uh, and it'll be the same for you because you're yeah, not goes, down here. Hey, we can fly over there together. Yeah, it's about so. three thousand plus. The you know, and hotels in Africa are expensive. They're not. They're no Motel Sixes or Airbnbs. No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> and so it, it it's going to take a big chunk of change mm. uh, because. And then we have to like purchase uh, Wi-Fi uh, access yeah, and yeah. base and we have so to get we're our, able to. We'll, what do we get at the we we always uh, after a meeting go sit down at the local cafe we get our french fries and our diet coke that costs money that's you know that's not free so well, to eat like a westerner in africa is expensive <laughs> yes it is yeah. and i i don't mean to be unkind but kevin i tried the local fair in tanzania and who was the one who almost died oh, of, of uh, <laughs> cholera uh, from so dirty bad. from unwashed from don't eat the lettuce i told you not to eat the lettuce you're like, oh it's fine you're real curry <laughs> oh i'm gonna be healthy fruits and vegetables and uh, kevin has everything boiled or everything canned it, and he's yeah. happy as can be I'm and i'm meat. dying i'm dying i'm my eyeballs are turning yellow i mean i'm just dying Oh, oh, the good old days. Tanzania, that was. I'm Kevin Coulson. Actually, that was a great way to yeah. lose weight quickly, but never mind. <laughs> no, no, that's uh, right. We need to finish the show. If they see that there's an hour YouTube of Unscripted, they, they won't even click it. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 761 of Anglican Unscripted.